commission study session. So our public comments, I see we have one. We actually have three. Uh, we have one, and then we have two that are on the Hidden Lakes subdivision. Okay. We'll take the one for public comments just in general. I believe that's Emily. Yes. And then the other two um, we'll just do when we get to that item. Come on, come on up, please. Where do I go? Go right over here. Over there? Fine. Yep, okay. thank you. All right. Good afternoon. I'm coming on behalf of some concerns, mom in town. Um, I'm bringing an issue today that I believe you could help every struggling family in our town, both literally by putting food on the table and also by providing a tangible increase to their mental health and feelings of security as we walk through this upcoming year. This year, experts seem to all agree that it will be a difficult year, both with food shortages and recession. So my issue is that of chickens. Eggs have increased at least 60% according to reports last week and this morning. Walmart has slightly decreased them um, this week down to 468 for a dozen. Last year I could purchase a dozen at Aldi for less than a dollar. So significant increase. It looks like we're looking for a hard year ahead, not only with expensive prices, but also struggling to even find them on the shelves. Um, this year, for example, we went three weeks without cream on any shelves within a 30 mile radius. That's what I drink in my coffee, so I know. Um, it was due to seeing this that my husband finally agreed to getting chickens after 18 years of begging. And we have many friends in Lawrence with chickens, and so I quickly texted them for details about their adorable coops, while my husband started looking up code details. It was only then that we realized that chickens are not allowed in Ottawa, and this is what I would like to change. Chickens are allowed in our surrounding towns with great success. Lawrence and Baldwin City and Topeka all allow chickens minus the rooster. Chickens are an excellent source for bug control, a problem that we have in my neighborhood, keeping kitchen waste out of landfills and improving the soil. They are also known to greatly decrease feelings of stress, as you probably know if you have teenagers and this crazy listening to chickens in the background while studying phase. Um, a city in Belgium offered, um, tested a theory and offered just three chickens per household to anyone that wanted them. They had 2,000 families say yes, and in one month, were able to drop 100 tons of food waste that would have otherwise gone into the landfill. I recognize this um, speaks to my household as I speak, cook three meals a day for six children and garden, so much of my waste goes into the trash. I would like very much to turn that trash into food for my children. Um, I would very much like for you to take a moment and look over some of the ordinances from some other towns and maybe look into their success. If you choose to look at these for a model, I would highly recommend looking at Lawrence and Baldwin City, as all the other town's ordinances were so confusing, I needed to be a lawyer to understand. Lawrence and Baldwin, it's very straightforward. Um, not to put additional pressure on you, but chicks purchased this spring will not lay eggs until August. I believe that our community would be very grateful and excited by this change. You would literally be helping parents put a very healthy food on the, their table and also easing the mental load by the knowledge that no matter what comes in the next few years, our children will have breakfast in the morning because it is literally being laid out in the coop in the backyard. Thank you for your time. Well, thank you. All right, that'll move us on to our city board interviews. Uh, the interviews we have today, both of them are for the Board of Zoning and Appeals. And the first one, I believe, is Kelsey Eads. Kelsey, come on up. Should I sit or should yes, I stand? Please. Okay. Kelsey, how are you? Good, how are you? Good, good. Uh, first of all, tell us a little bit who you are, a little bit about yourself, and uh, then we'll get to the hard questions. Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Kelsey Eads. Um, I am a realtor, well, newly licensed realtor here in Ottawa. Um, I work with the Remax in town, and we do a lot of fundraising events um, to donate back into the town. And then I also have a lot of experience with um, just volunteering in the community in general. Um, I grew up here, I've been here 20, 24 years, that's kind of hard to say. Um, <laughs> I grew up here and I just remember um, growing up, I went to all these different community events and I felt like the city of Ottawa kind of took care of me and raised me. And so that's something I'm looking forward to giving back as I um, have gotten my license and I'm getting more involved. I'm just trying to find even more avenues to be involved and keep giving back. Thank you. Yeah. Commissioner Graves, do you want to start with the questions? Sure. 
Uh, why do you want to serve on this particular board, the Board of Zoning Appeals? Um, like I said, I just got my real estate license, so I feel like it's um, a good way for me to get in there and learn more. Commissioner Kayla? I can see you being here today. Yeah. Um, I appreciate you just putting your name forward, so thank you. Um, tell me what do you know about the board, or the board of Zoning Appeals and what changes or improvements could you recommend? Um, I know something that comes across a lot in real estate is variances, and um, I think it's important to kind of make, consider those more. Um, I just think it's something that is important that we should be discussing, and so I'd like to be a part of that conversation. Commissioner Clayton. First of all, congratulations on getting recently licensed. Thank you. That's exciting. As someone who just did the same thing. Yeah, congrats to you. Um, how well do you think the board currently is serving the needs of its citizens? Um, I feel like they're doing a good job. <laughs> Would you have any ideas for kind of similarly like that, like ways they could better improve? The um, I think just educating the community as much as possible. Um, I think that applies to any board. Just providing education is where you're going to find value. So. Sure. Also, congratulations on your licensing. I think that's something they just don't hand those out. I know it's difficult, so congratulations <laughs> on hard you. work and study to make that accomplishment. So, congratulations. Uh, I don't know, have you watched any of the current or past uh, meetings that the, the Board of Zoning Appeals has been online? Not recently, yes, no. If you had or not. Well, let me just ask you this in what role do you see the Board of Zoning Appeals serving for the city? Um, I feel like it's it's important to have people in place that are able to vote on those decisions fairly um, because you do need some rules and regulations to make sure everything runs smoothly. Like have three check instead of two or two yeah. four or whatever. <laughs> well, you gotta find your balance, yeah. yeah. Okay, <laughs> Kelsey, one of the questions we always ask, um, and it's not on this, but um, um, being any kind of board, in any kind of board, um, you might have somebody who doesn't agree with what it, the decision you make. Um, how would you feel if somebody were to question your decision, and how do you think you would handle that? Um, I think it's important to have, that's why I like boards, I feel like it's important to have people with different backgrounds and different experience to be able, I think it's good for someone to vote yes, and maybe I vote no. That way you can really list out your pros and cons, why we would need it or why we wouldn't need it. And I just think it's good to have a contrast. Sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? Is there sure any question you wish we would ask you? I thought we were going to ask you. I don't think so. Okay. I see on here you've been on some missions trips. Where have you been? Um, we went to South Dakota a couple different times, okay. and Joplin right after they had their big tornado. Um, when we went out to South Dakota, we did a lot of, there's the Oglala Indian tribe, and we stayed at a church there, and we had breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and we had like an after-school type program. Okay. It would take books out there. Okay. So, yeah. Well, thanks for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Kelsey, thank you. Um, we have one Sorry. more. No, there. All right, we have yeah. one more interview, and then uh, we might have a discussion later on. I'm not sure, uh, but once we make that decision, we'll certainly get back to you on, on our decision. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. All right, our next interview is going to be Carla Griffith. Carla, come on up, please. Good afternoon. Hello. Please state your name and then tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, my name is Carla Griffith. I moved into the community about eight years ago, having worked with the military and uh, served the military community. I uh, graduated from college in Salina, Kansas, married my sweetheart out there, and we began our adventures. And we've lived in several countries and several states in America. We always thought it was important to give back to the community and look for ways to volunteer. Since moving into this community, I've worked out at the uh, volunteer out at Hillsdale Range, working with uh, shooting events out there as a judge. Also worked with the hunting and fishing education and worked in several events up in Topeka. 
I have served on the Franklin County Heritage Homes Board. I have also been a member of the vestry for the Episcopal uh, Church here in town and have volunteered at the uh, Grace Episcopal um, Church thrift shop here until it's closing and then COVID hit and have been kind of sequestered. And so now I'm kind of getting back out there and looking for opportunities where I can fit on and serve in the community here. Great, thank you. Commissioner Graves? Why do you wanna serve on this particular board, which is the Board of Zoning Appeals? Well, moving into the community on the civilian side, we, we have a home here that has an acre and a half of property and have um, been up to the planning board a couple of times to um, appeal to them to give us permission to put up a shed in addition to our house. So I've gone up there, uh, worked with them to get, so I'd like, you know, it seemed interesting. Thanks for being here today. Um, could you tell me about what you know about the um, Board of Zoning Appeals and um, what you would see as a recommendation or some changes or improvements that you would like to see happen? Well, having gone through my process of improving our property here, um, we, we noticed that some of the ordinances didn't coordinate with one another. And uh, so bringing those coordinations and making it one smooth, such as where to where the property line where you can put a border uh, uh, building up. Um, there was two different ordinances, and so we'd like to see some um, bringing that together in, under one system, which seems to be needed in this in this town. Commissioner Clayton, how well overall would you say? From your perspective that the board serves the needs kind of like you said with some of those ordinances and some of the issues you've firsthand kind of experienced well it was interesting to find out that there were two different types of ordinances for the same issue so that to me was like okay there's some improvement that can be made there and uh, just working with people in the board and getting to know them was uh, something I'd never done, having been in the military community so much. Uh, being on the civilian side is a little bit different, but good order and discipline is always welcome everywhere. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mayor Brooke, I'm sorry. Yeah. You're all welcome. Uh, well, I'll ask you the same question. Have you witnessed, besides your own situation on the board, to watch any kind of debate or discussion of the members? Other than your own situation? No. Okay. Well, then, what, uh, what role do you see uh, the zoning appeal serving for the city? Well, if somebody has a grievance of what was already been put forward to them, to have a place where they can come and, and let their grievances be aired, and maybe they can find a, um, we could find a, a common ground between the ordinances and the citizens of what they want here in their community. So, uh, yeah, I think that's kind of important as a board member to be able to facilitate that. Carla, um, part of the Board of Zoning Appeals, sometimes you deal with disgruntled contractors <laughs> um, who may act, you know, see you at a price chopper or something like that, you know, in town and, and want to air their grievances with you there. Um, how do you think you would handle that? Um, if that were to occur? Well, I think I would stop and listen to them and be respectful to their opinions because they are here to make a business and they're here and this is their livelihood if they're declined a, a planning permit or a building permit. And so um, I think it's very important to listen to the, the contractor. It doesn't matter where I am. If they want to visit with me, I'm, I'm open to visit. I'm, uh, we're retired, so we have plenty of time. We have uh, the ability, I have the ability to meet at any time because this is not a um, scheduled meeting, it's only when it's necessary, so I can move my appointments around whenever necessary to make myself available <coughs> to the issues that are at hand. Thank you. Commissioners, any other questions? For the record, most of the contractors are gruntled. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> For the most part. For the most part. Yeah. 
Uh, one question I would have from your experience in the military, do you think would that do you think provide you any valuable insight having lived probably on either bases or places where you probably couldn't make changes as much? Obviously you don't know zoning in on bases and stuff, but that's a well, unique perspective. It is it is a unique um upbringing because I was also born into the military. My dad was in, served as a, in the Air Force. And so uh, being on the civilian side is very intriguing to me how the government works with the citizens here and having served for our country and seeing it at work and being able to now participate in it because being in the military system, you were not allowed to really be in the government of your surrounding community. So this is a, a wonderful opportunity for me to uh, give back yet again to this community because so many people have come here before and made this community such a great place to live. Yeah, really like it. Is there anything that we would, you wish we would have asked you today or that we didn't ask you that you thought you think we should have asked you? Um, not that I can think of. I have a question. As a board member, uh, is there a liability if somebody like a disgruntled person wants to sue the board for planning? I mean, what what kind of insurance do we need to have as board members? Mr. Legal Counsel, <laughs> she asked if there's any liability on behalf if she was part of the board. Yeah. No liability. So we can just make our decision if somebody wants to um, doesn't agree with it, what would be the next step of appeal? The Board of Zoning Appeals hears disputes that have to do with interpretations of the building code. If they're not satisfied with the uh, decision of the Board of Zoning Appeals, usually that decision is final. They go to district court in some instances. They're aggrieved by that decision. But there's no personal liability to a member of the board for the decisions that are made when you're acting in the official capacity. So then the, the city attorney then would go to the court and take care of all of that. Okay, thank you. Anything else? All right, Carla, thank you for your time today. Thank you. As I thank told you. Ms. Ms. Eads, uh, we will have a discussion possibly later, and when the decision is made, we'll, we'll let you know. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate thank both you. your time. All right, that'll move us on to items for presentation and discussion. Our first item is challenges of, challenges of adopting banned breeds. Vanessa, come on up. I How are you have, this afternoon? Good. I have my PowerPoint. Okay. How do I deliver that? <laughs> you qualified to handle that? Yeah. <laughs> and I also want to introduce Katie Barnett. Uh, she is our attorney for Prairie Paws. She also represents a lot of the animal shelters in Kansas. And she's worked on this specific language for cities before. So if I could have anyone in the room with me, she's the gal. She's done it. Also introduce her as the smartest person in the room. That's what I usually say when I bring her in. Let's see. that going. Also, I'm pro chicken. <laughs> Couldn't agree more about the chicken. Is that another, is that another band breed? <laughs> you don't need roosters to make eggs, too. Because if you hate roosters, you don't always hate chickens. You still have eggs without roosters. <laughs> I don't know, I feel like you built a character being chased by roosters back in the You've never been chased by a rooster. By you don't know flight. the terror. Yeah. 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 Did it's you like go to therapy for the like same a, thing? Yeah, it's like a little velociraptor with wings yeah. coming so at you. Well, yeah. That would be seized for your head. Yes. You'd like that. Yeah, I never knew I was so fast. <laughs> <laughs> the rooster <laughs> works. Have you reviewed the Jenna and have her have the plan or wish we could have it Matt, when you say a little bit, like how long? Okay, I was gonna say we would we could move on to something else if we'd like. Do you want us to do that? Yeah. 
Okay. This is Windows computers. There's a Mac. <laughs> the face he made when I was like, I have a PowerPoint. He was like, ugh. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you see foot on that chair? Classic dad joke. <laughs> you're, okay. you're the man. Well, you are the man. Remember, wait, I don't. I don't. We're on. I know. Did you know that the people in Dubai don't like the Flintstones, but the people in Abu Dhabi do? <laughs> Did you know that? <laughs> Maybe we should have cut that. <laughs> this is about being retired. <laughs> yes. He reads joke books all day. Our viewing audience just dropped. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, there we go. There it is. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Do you advance it for us as well? Yeah. Wow. You can scoot right on to number two. <laughs> okay. Let's do some time. Just go. Maybe it's time for another joke. No. Oh, hurry up, <laughs> man, please. Okay. <laughs> oh, boy, I'm sorry, I got some transitions in there. Uh, did you? Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I have to keep clicking. Here. Do you want, do you want me to run? There we go. There we go. Okay. okay. So we will try and get through this quickly, but it's a it's a complicated topic, so that's why we have a presentation to keep me on track, not get me out in the weeds. Um, but the agreement came up, and uh, Mayor Pro Tem Skidmore reached out to me about our agreement that was coming up for renewal and what is in the agreement. And you know, it is in there that we serve as the advisor, so I'm glad that we were called in uh, to talk about this today because it's outlined in that agreement that we would and that we provide temporary housing uh, to ensure adoption and then uh, continuing to regulate based on breed has some challenges for us. So we have some challenges with the whole approach. And so I just kind of wanted to go through step by step of what those are. Uh, and then we also have some information from some other agencies and some other legal entities about this. So you can go to the next one. Oh, sorry, I was just going to jump in there. So there's been a lot of study recently from the National Institutes of Health and their canine genome project. They just published a study toward the end of 2022 that found that uh, breed had no basis in behavior um, that we categorize as aggression. Certainly they have, um, you know, herding dogs herd, and they concluded that to an extent that applies, but to those behaviors that are traditionally known as aggressive or associated with aggression, breed had absolutely no effect on that. So um, that's new. It's not something that was discussed before. Um, and then when we talk about ancestry um, coinciding with physical appearance, it's just so tremendously hard for any shelter um, and actually in studies dating back 10 years for any veterinarian, public health officer, police officer, animal control officer um, to determine accurately and reliably, which are pretty important if this is a criminal offense in your city code, if it is a misdemeanor offense, that it's accurate and reliable. And the studies for the last decade have shown that physical appearance identification is not accurate when it's compared to the ancestry of the dog, the DNA test of the dog. Um, there was a case in Leewood recently. Um, the 
stuff to see here. I just copied the opinion from the judge. Judge Sutherland found that Leewood's breed specific legislation was unconstitutional because it gave no parameters for enforcement. Um, it had nothing out there for animal control or the police department to use to identify a breed of dog other than this list of, of breeds. And further, it had um, the city code look very similar to Ottawa's. It had the purebred breeds listed, and then it said, or any mix thereof. Um, and so that's really, really hard to what, like what, what percentage predominant in some cases has meant more than 25%, 50%, 51%, you know, what, it, what is a golden doodle? You know, if that, what if it was a golden retriever and pit bull, is it a pit bull or a golden retriever? Which one is it? And, and so does it matter if it comes out a smooth coat or a curly coat? If it's a smooth coat, maybe it's more likely to be identified as a pit bull, but it's 50%, it's just as much a pit bull as it is a golden retriever. And that's what the animal shelters run into, and I'm, you won't speak for your law enforcement, but I imagine it's tough for law enforcement similarly. And so all of the emerging research um, and studies show that it's really, really hard to enforce um, reliably and accurately. Um, Okay, yeah, you want to scoot on from there? Or you have well, to add I wanted to add on to the DNA testing. So, you know, um, Mayor Pro Tem Skidmore brought this up on the phone is how accurate is it? How expensive is it? How time consuming is it? And we've just recently done 65 DNA samples on dogs that have come through prey paws in the last 90 days. It is exceedingly expensive. It's $80 a dog, which doesn't sound like much but it also drags out the time that the dog sits in the shelter waiting for the results to come back, which has been upwards of a month. Um, the majority of the dogs we tested had over 13 breeds in them. And we tested every dog that we had. We didn't just pick ones that looked a certain way and didn't look a certain way. Uh, and what we found out too, was that depending on what that other dog was that was in the mix, totally changed what the dog came out looking like. So uh, there was a dog that I would have thought was very predominantly physical appearance of a pit bull type dog. Uh, and it was not, it was 50% on the nose, but I thought it was gonna be more like 90%. This dog looked to me almost purebred. The coloring of the dog's face, it had black patches on its cheeks, which made its cheeks look really big. <laughs> but if it didn't have that coloring and it would have looked totally different. And if the other dogs in the DNA mix were dogs that looked more like pit bulls. They were American Bulldogs and they were smooth coated dogs like that. I had another dog come in that I did not think at all had any pit bull in her at all. And she was nearly 60%, but because she was mixed with a Husky, she came out looking nothing like a pit bull. And so this is the problems that we're having is that the physical identification is not matching up with the DNA. And even though I thought advancements in DNA would help us, it's actually made it so much more obvious that what we see on the outside is not reflected on the inside. Uh, there's also <coughs> dominant and recessive traits in dogs and so not every gene is created equally and so you know you might have five percent of this go in but one dog we had come out looked so much like a bulldog it was only three percent of our dna but because those genes were so dominant they overplayed some of those other recessive genes so we are having a problem with visual yeah. identification dna testing unfortunately has muddied the waters even further for us and so it hasn't been anything that we can really use um, for this so interestingly just uh to kind of put a little science to that, golden retrievers have a black gene, it's recessive. So that's why they have like the eyeliner and their pads are black. Um, that is recessive. You breed golden retrievers and you, you get just those little traits in their physical appearance, which is what your ordinance says. Your ordinance doesn't say what is the actual ancestry of the dog? It says, what is the physical appearance? And so um, if you breed a black smooth coated dog to a golden retriever, you're gonna get a bunch of black smooth coated puppies because that dominant, that recessive gene becomes dominant because it was bred with. And so it's, it's just so incredibly difficult. There's so much science behind this. Um, I'm sure Vanessa can send you all kinds of stuff um, if you want. Um, <laughs> we also me. tested litter mates and their genetic composition was different from each other. And so that's hard to enforce. You may have said this, how often do you DNA test? We just did it because we got, we wrote a grant for donated uh -huh. DNA tests. 
We just did 65 in the last 30 days. Other than that, we don't do it as a matter of practice because it's so unaffordable. Right. Will you advance the slide? There's just a little sample. This is one of the dogs we tested that came through Prairie Paws. <laughs> 13 breeds was the average that we saw. Most of the physical appearance traits that you see are coming from the Husky and the Malamute. But this dog has a significant amount of Fitbull and American Staffordshire Terrier mixed in there. But he has blue eyes, he's tricolor coat, he has a pricked tail, a pricked curly tail, and pricked ears. All of those physical characteristics are rare in band breeds, but dominant in the snow breeds. So you get a dog that I would not have thought had any Pitbull in this dog. And so, yeah, we adopted that out in city limits pretty quickly. You can advance. So I just, um, part of my job is to look when I practice animal law. So part of my job is to look to what other cities and counties and states and, and what is everybody else doing? Um, what is effective? Um, and that's what all of these professional organizations do. The American Bar Association recommended almost 10 years ago that at any city or state should repeal their breed specific legislation. It's difficult to enforce and it causes due process issues. The International Municipal Lawyers Association um, put out their model ordinance in 2016 or 17, um, and it repealed any reference to breed specific legislation. So the IMLA is suggesting that cities now just have behavior based ordinance language. Um, that's their model. Um, the Department of Justice, Fair Housing Act, Department of Defense, any any regulatory body that deals with animals and specifically dogs says behavior based is best. Um, when, of course, when it comes to service animals, emotional support animals, um, the federal government says you can't discriminate based on breed. Um, you know, but you have to figure out what's best for Ottawa. Um, and uh, Eudora recently repealed, uh, Overland Park recently repealed. I know that's a little ways away. Prairie Village. Prairie Village repealed. Um, and then there are actually 22 states in the country that prohibit cities from enacting breed specific legislation because it has been such a significant cost to the the cities um, and um, it just it doesn't enhance public safety. I think that's what we're all concerned about. Certainly what I'm concerned about in my practice. Um, so I'm kind of you can advance the slide. Yeah, so this is kind of where I landed at the end of the day was breed specific legislation has no scientific evidence that it improves public safety. There's no science connecting the behavior of the dog to the breed of the dog. The breed of the dog is inherently so difficult to figure out, which means it's difficult for a citizen to know that they're following the law. Uh, when, I, when I look at all the other laws that we have, we know how fast our car is going, we have a speedometer. We don't know how many breeds are in our dog. There's no gauge on the outside telling us how much pit bull. Uh, but a lot of our other ordinances focus on things that are easily measured. And so the behavior of a dog actually is easily measured. And so if we could aim the ordinances towards that, it helps. Um, you know, I have a couple examples of why the we feel so strongly that pit bulls are dangerous. And I know that there are people probably watching, there's probably people in the room that feel that they're dangerous. And it's hard to think that there's no science to prove that. The reason that we think there's science to prove that is because a lot of those research papers didn't account for prevalence. We don't know the percentage of those dogs that are in the community, so we don't know how to scale the number of bites to how many of those breeds are here. So that's a problem. If you run a dog bite study up in Canada and Alaska, sled dogs account for the most bites because there's more of them. Um, it's the classic car insurance snafu of white cars were thought to be involved in more accidents. Uh, they were not. There was more white cars on the road. But we're able to know how many colors of cars are on the road. We don't know that with dogs. Um, the AVMA is the American Veterinary Medical Association. They represent every veterinarian in the country, and they're against this. And their job is to keep veterinarians safe because there's no science behind it. So what is their science behind? And what? how do you increase public safety? Uh, there is really good data on this of the risk factors that do generate a more statistical likelihood of a dog bite happening in the home. And that's the stuff where I think we can work together to kind of address that stuff. These are the main risk factors. So if you're thinking of a situation or an anecdotal experience where I'm, 
I'm so sad that you had a bad experience with a dog and that you were bitten or you know someone. I would put money on these factors being to play in that situation. That, and if you start to compound these risk factors, it's now a bite waiting to happen, especially if you have, uh, you know, maybe multiple dogs in the home and they're unaltered and they live on a tether. Um, no able bodied person to intervene is the big one. Uh, so we see that a lot. And the, the number one age that kids are getting bitten is under 10. So those are the people that we need to save and protect is the people under 10. And these are the dogs that are going to bite those kids. It's not necessarily breed, it's these things. I think you can advance. So, like I said, the International Municipal Lawyers Association has done a ton of research on this, figured out what works, works best in which communities, and then put it all into a model act. Um, and I'm not an expert on what happens in Ottawa. I know that you have a vicious animal and vicious dog ordinance. There's a section for that, and they're just straight up prohibited. Um, there, there's this move in the last you know, couple decades to start working on increased levels of behavior. I don't know what happens when a dog bites someone here. I don't know if it just, it depends on if there's a complainant. I don't know, I don't know all that, but I can tell you what other communities do and what they have found to be effective. And that's having an increased level of responsibility and, and based on those behavioral risk factors. <laughs> defining nuisance animals, you know, those animals that get out a lot and that you have those recurring interactions with animal owners, that is critical. Um, nuisance animals, and then they exhibit behaviors predictive of a bite, sort of back to those risk factors that Vanessa talks about, charging, chasing, behaving in a manner that a reasonable person would believe poses a serious and unjustified threat. Um, and then you have restrictions placed on ownership, um, and you can appeal a declaration if you want to. Dangerous animal is, you, you already have a lot of the, what you see in dangerous animal ordinances here in Ottawa, which is um, if a dog bites someone, but not severely, or if it gets out and uh, bites another animal, you have these restrictions that you place on that animal. Um, leash, muzzle confinement, that's all actually, those are all actually restrictions that are placed on pit bulls that were here before 1987, which I imagine you guys don't see at all anymore. Um, vicious animal is uh, traditionally like the highest level of uh, behavior that could pose a threat to public safety, meaning that um, a dog that's killed another domestic animal or caused severe injury. Um, and then if you'll advance it, the slide real quick, then I can talk about the, yeah. So having these model dangerous dog ordinances, um, it's so great to have definable behavior. Um, everyone knows what's expected of them, um, satisfies due process. Uh, it, it helps with community enforcement. It helps the police animal control officers. It helps everyone, uh, helps your trier of fact when it comes to a citation. Um, and so all of this, instead of those like really vague, the vague language that says, you know, oh, has, has a propensity to be aggressive or, um, you know, puts fear in a, a passerby or something like that. And so I just think that there's, there's so much now, especially with the International Municipal Lawyers Association putting out their model act and guidance that uh, cities are adopting all over the place. Um, I think that there's an opportunity here to enhance public safety and to look at the, the newest information because, you know, I, I don't know what your, your Pitbullian was enacted, um, but, you know, most of them were in the 80s and 90s, early 2000s. And we, we hadn't even like sequenced the human genome back then. Like we know so much more. There has been so much more exponentially more information about human animal interactions. We know so much more about canine behavior. And it's just great to take that information, data and facts and science and apply it to what would keep your community safe. Um, I, think I have like two more points to make, yeah. and then I know that <laughs> we'll get the light flicked on and off. Um, so, you know, why can't Prey Paws just act in favor of the city and err on the side of, hey, it looks kind of like a pit bull, let's not adopt it out. Uh, the truth of that is that it raises our costs considerably. Uh, if we were to go, every dog that looks kind of like a pit bull cannot be adopted in city limits, mm -hmm. we're raising the length of stay of all the dogs in our population. 
uh, and that the scope of our agreement doesn't address that. Uh, we're not we're not getting funded to house every dog, you know, for 40 days uh, to try and find it a home outside of city limits because it might have some pit bull in it. If the police department brings us a pit bull and says you cannot adopt this out in city limits, we absolutely comply with that because they've gone to the effort to identify that dog, give us the instruction. Um, we're not going to take on the duty of identifying every single dog and figuring out how much pit bull it has in it. Um, it also works against our mission. Um, it, we have a firm position against breed specific legislation and we always have. Uh, we're an animal welfare organization, just like a human services organization would not like to be told to discriminate against certain humans. We do not like to be told to discriminate against certain dogs. Um, if the language of the agreement would be adjusted to have any of this in it, I would be concerned that our board would not agree to that uh, because it so firmly fights what we're about. Uh, so I, I think that that's something that, that we need to think about. Um, what I would like to do is address the risk factors. Uh, I would like to see that spay neuter become more accessible to households that have those risk factors, dogs over 50 pounds, dogs who are unaltered, dogs on tethers, dogs on chains, get those dogs spayed and neutered now, especially if they're under five years old. That's where all the stats line up. Uh, <coughs> Prey Paws would like to go partner with every school in the school district, every daycare, and do age appropriate bite prevention for every child under 10 years old. That is what's going to stop dog bites and that's what's going to help everything so if we can attack it from those those two sides maybe we don't need breed specific legislation because maybe we're doing something that's a little bit more science-based now i know what everyone's thinking is we just talked about this we did um mayor at the time kayla brought it up uh, and it went through multiple study sessions in late 2021 and i know it we don't like to set a precedent for Hey, we didn't like that vote. Can we talk about it again? I don't I don't want to live in a community where we also re rehash things that have been, you know, put to rest. But we have so much more data now that we did then. I also don't I didn't really see a lot of experts come in the last few study sessions that we did in 2021. I didn't see canine behaviorist veterinarians. I didn't see science uh, come in. I know there was some good anecdotal evidence. And if that's what we're going to listen to, then I would like my anecdotal evidence as well of the thousands of good experiences that I've had um, to be considered as well. So I also know that we've got a different mix on the commission now than we did. Um, Commissioner Clayton was not on the commission at the time. Commissioner Wygand was. Would the vote go the same way? I don't know. Um, I would like to. I would like to see this discussed again, um, if, if that's possible. I know respectfully. We've taken a lot of your time. <laughs> Any questions? I don't have a question. I just have a comment. And I know um, you brought up that you, it's not the purpose isn't just to keep rehashing this, which I agree with. Um, but also, you know, it was brought up as a concern by a citizen that um, what if Prairie Paws is adopting out animals? You know, so I, I feel like this is a different perspective than um, us looking at our at the agreement is a different um, I guess kind of umbrella that we're looking at rather than just the specific breed ban. I mean, it, it's, it affects you guys as well. And I think it's a great point that we need your input as well. So I, I, to, to agree with you on that, if we were to stop adopting out dogs of this appearance into to Ottawa or be, or be more strict with our approach on that, because we do try and consider that if we were to further regulate that, that means good altered dogs of this appearance will not go into Ottawa. And if those people really want a dog of that appearance, they're going to get one from somewhere else that is not spayed and neutered, has not been handled extensively. And you could end up with a negative impact on public safety if we can't adopt good prairie paws dogs here and people really want a dog of that appearance. They might get one somewhere else. Thank you. For, for your staff, if the police bring a dog in that you obviously aren't going to adopt back to Ottawa, how do they find out if it's an Ottawa address, but it's inside the city limits? Uh, or is it just 866067 no, is out the window? You no, know, uh, we usually do a Google search. We have never really had anyone ride on the cusp. It's usually pretty obvious that they're like way out mm -hmm. on 68, you know, way out. Um, so we'll do a bit of a Google search. Uh, it's, it's infrequent that the dogs are coming from the police department that we're getting. So I can only think of maybe five or six in the last year where a police officer said this cannot go back in the city limits of Ottawa. And that's what we did. And the owners were compliant with that. You brought about the neutralization. Is that 
also another legal problem that could arise if we thought one was like a pit bull and was required to be neutralized before it was adopted out. Mm. Uh, I don't know how do you. Do well, any neutralized is neutered or, inter or euthanized. Neutralized is a good, yeah. good, that's a good word. word. Yeah. Actually, that's a new word. <laughs> so, by state law, you have to spay or neuter any animal that comes from the animal shelter. Animals oh, can't okay. leave prairie paws without being spayed or neutered. If they're unless there's an exception, whether it's mm -hmm. age or something like that, they can sign a waiver under state law, um, and then they, but they do have to get it altered within a certain period of time. Okay. That's mm -hmm. Now, if you see someone's pet and you want to spay or neuter it before they have an opportunity to reclaim, that's not okay. That's not okay. okay. Yeah. And I guess the, the aggressive behavior idea, I mean, unfortunately, the only way to know is after maybe a reactionary accident or somehow a dog gets out and bites somebody. Is that right? Is there a way to determine the viciousness of the animal, I guess, before something happens? Yeah, there's certainly the predictive factors and and attacking those predictive factors has been really helpful in other communities and spending putting resources into edu public education spay neuter ensuring that people are compliant with your roaming laws your dogs at large ordinances um and i mean I and think the model dog ordinance I, the language for that you know it has nuisance behavior because that behavior has been defined as leading to aggressive behavior so constantly being loose, that activity in the community, charging fence lines with other people in it, jumping up on postal workers, that kind of stuff has been scientifically proven to down the line pose an increased threat. And so if you can address it early on with an infraction, uh, you know, with the police department. The other thing the International Municipal Lawyers Association set out was a reckless pet owner provision. So we're actually targeting repeat offenders um, who are whose animals are constantly getting out, chasing people, or they're not licensed, they don't have the rabies vaccine, really targeting the, the pet owner. Um, but the fact of the matter is you you can you're risking that every day with every other breed, with every other dog that bites. Um, so it would be more beneficial for a community to have something like a nuisance animal ordinance that targets that predictive behavior and and targets it before a bite happens. Okay. And then uh, Chief uh, Weingartner on this, when an officer brings an animal in and they tell the very pause, this is a, appears to be a pit bull or it's vicious or did some kind of behavioral issue that you determine it to be vicious, not necessarily a pit bull. Your officers train, or what? Tell me about how they determine if the animal is not relocatable in Ottawa. Certainly, the animal patrol officer is trained to definitely identify the breed just by looking at, of course, you know, questions about DNA come up. And the municipal court has had to do DNA testing on some trials in the past. Can't tell you the exact number. I just know they've done it a few times. It doesn't happen very often. Uh, a lot of it comes from the owners identifying the dog as that specific breed for the patrol officer in response. So then, Chief, what percentage do we go by? Do you, does the police department go by when it's pit bull? Because as Vanessa said, there's one up there that was 23%. Is that a pit bull by our definition? Uh, the definition is, I mean, I could read it to you, but there is no percents listed in the definition. So if it's 1%, it's, it's a pit bull. We don't, there's no percents listed in the city ordinance. It says predominantly, and, and you know, it depends on how a court's going to interpret that. Um, if there's 13 breeds and two of them are pit bull, like, what does it, do, you know, is it percentage-wise or what? But what, where enforcement runs into constitutional issues and, like, what happened in the Leewood case is, do you have a, you know, what do you have to determine whether or not it, it is predominant? Do you have a 10-point checklist like they did in Denver? Do you have, um, how, how do you go about that? How are you trained to determine the breed identification? What, what about that dog you saw up there? What percentage of that dog? And then, and then what percentage do you say physical appearance? Because that's what your ordinance says is physical appearance. It doesn't say anything about a DNA test. It doesn't say what the genetic makeup of the dog is, which can be, you know, as studies show, one in every two shelter workers, one in every two veterinarians completely and wholly misidentifies dogs that they thought had a small amount of pitbull in them. Um, in every single study that's created and recreated. 
Um, and so you almost have to reconcile that too. Do you mean genetically pit bull or do you mean just as a low pit bull? I know another point that, that you made over the phone was if, if I got bit by a chihuahua, I would walk away, you know, and I, I hear that one a lot, right? We've heard that. That's not breed, that's size. So if that's an argument against pit bulls, it's an argument against every dog over 50 pounds. And so I think we can definitely target spay neuter approach to dogs over 50 pounds because they have more capacity to cause harm if they were to exhibit aggressive behavior. And Prairie Paws is absolutely supportive of that. You know, if we can do lower cost coupon discount spay neuter for dogs over 50 pounds, yes. Because if they do turn bad, it's a it's a bigger trip to the ER than if a Jack Russell. And I think that's definitely worth thinking about. I will say do keep in mind that the American Kennel Club definition of the size of the American Pitbull Terrier, Bull Terrier, Staffordshire Bull Terrier, and American Staffordshire Terrier are between 35 and 55 pounds. These are small to medium sized dogs um, when it comes to the 200 AKC dogs that are out there. Um, and so if you want to start regulating dogs, I mean, Labrador Retriever is just exponentially weighs more than a Pitbull Terrier. So like we've probably taken enough time. Any more questions? Commissioners, any other questions for, for Vanessa, Chief? All right. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you for your time. Thank you. All right, that'll move us on to item two, which is a discussion on the Hidden Lake subdivision preliminary plat. Director Hall. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <clears throat> I too. I also. <laughs> okay, so <coughs> Hidden Lakes, Strawberry Plat. Strawberry Plat for the subdivision, the Planning Commission has the authority to approve Strawberry Plat. So you do not typically see Strawberry Plats. Um, the reason this is before you today. For two reasons. One is that uh, the right of way that's being proposed to provide access to include a dedication of a new public street for an extension of Princeton is narrower than the minimum right of way required for a local residential street. So um, it, it requires a variance or exception to the subdivision regulations. On all, in almost any instance, the Board of Zoning Appeals does not have authority to grant right variances to the subdivision regulations. That authority rests with the city commission based on certain findings. The second reason this is before you is because it's designed as recommended by staff with uh, uh, South Princeton north of the intersection, the two-way segment uh, being barricaded at its south end. And so for those two reasons, that's in front of you today. Hidden Lakes is a nine acre residential subdivision consisting of 24 residential lots. These are single family residential homes, three bedroom, two bath, two car garage is what's planned. Uh, it's being built, uh, it's not really relevant to the decision, but it, it is uh, in large part financed with low income housing tax credit financing. Um, it's being done by a developer that's used to doing this, used to managing these programs, uh, it does it in communities in Oklahoma and Kansas and probably other states as well. The plat does include public streets, sidewalks, extension of public utilities and stormwater collection and management. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So process, uh, at our suggestion, the developer held a community meeting with neighbors prior to submitting an application. And that had a lot to do with closing of the street or barricading of the street. I shouldn't say that we're closing of the street, barricading the street. Then application submittal that included a traffic impact study. A preliminary plot was approved by the Planning Commission subject to the conditions, subject to conditions of approval, including uh, the consideration by you of the narrow right of way width. That was on January 11th. You know, the public hearing and several people attended, representing four or five property owners, four or five parcels, I'd say. So 
we're at, at the point of where you're considering a variance and the barricade across South Princeton, and then following all of that, we'll come back and there'll be a final plat once the uh, roadway has been, the, the construction documents for the roadway design and other utilities have been reviewed and approved, and uh, the financing those has been addressed. This is the general location. Uh, as you can see, the, it's kind of an L-shaped parcel overall, but the first phase is that, that uh, northwest corner of the property. So uh, one thing I want to point out is right now it's at 24 units. Once this reaches a threshold of 30, which it will at the next phase, uh, it will require a second access. So development of this property at any substantial level is going to require two points of access. And the second access as designed will be the, at, at the right of way for Cedar Street that's uh, at the south, kind of the south, it's actually to the south uh, west of the corner of the parcel. The owner has obtained an easement for future access to the north end of Cedar, which is in front of the Walmart property. Next slide. Well, that really does not come in very well. I apologize for that. So this is in your in your packet, and this is there are two sheets that show the preliminary plot, and this is the larger one. Um, you can't really see anything in this slide. I really apologize about that. I didn't anticipate that. It looked okay in the slide. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, that really does not come out very well. Um, if you look in your packet. Maybe that, I think, turn off the lights. Maybe that would help. That would probably help. It's, it's on, it's in this page in your packet. Pages aren't necessarily marked. In page 10. Yeah, it still doesn't have to come in very well. But if you look at that page, um, that shows you the layout of the subdivision. The access at the extension of 19th, 19th of Princeton, intersection um, and then this street stubs here for future development over here and there are 24 lots there's one lot there that's a it's, it's platted as a 25 lot subdivision but one of those lots is for a an office clubhouse type of uh, structure and then there's a track for uh, a top lot a recreation track if you look at this page here, the attention basin is up there for the stormwater. So that large area that doesn't have lots on it, that's a detention basin for this to manage the stormwater. Next slide. This doesn't come through very well either. Um, I, you know, this came through during the planning commission, so I don't know why it's doing that. But um, this is the next page in your packet. So this is the right of way and the proposed extension of 19th Street. <clears throat> Prior to the application, we had multiple conversations with the developer about that issue because we knew that that was going to come before you. And so we wanted to uh, make sure that that was designed appropriately. And so there was quite a bit of discussion about how that roadway is designed. One thing I will say is the roadway and the curb gutter and sidewalk, those meet standards. It's just that the right of way is narrow. So that right of way currently is a parcel that they own. They don't have control over any of the land on each side of that. So that, that speaks to one of the findings that you're required to make in order to approve this right of way with. They're extending utilities to the site, and a lot of those utilities are going to be in an easement, a utility easement on the north side of the right of way. Next slide. So to address that, that issue of the right of way with, the Planning Commission reviewed this, the staff's recommendation, and adopted these findings. These are findings that are in our ordinance. I'm not gonna repeat them, but um, if you have any questions about why, in staff's opinion or Planning Commission's opinion, 
that it meets these findings, I'll be happy to try to address that. What's the required width and what is this? Is a couple of feet short, right? Was it, it's uh, the required width is 60 feet for a local residential street, right? And this and this is about 45. It's probably between okay. 43 and 45. Okay. So the reason there's additional width of the street, why you like it, is that. Um, so you have some right of way and easement on both sides in the event you have to put some utilities in or something like that. Um, in this particular case, I think well, you have to ask Dennis about how the utilities are going to get in there. But basically, um, if you make this exception, the street takes up almost all the right of way. Well, on the north side, we do have also the easement, and as Mike said, the, the utilities will all be run in that easement on the north side, and we do have room. We already have a design for that. So the reason I'm handing this out, this addresses the stormwater Normally, maybe I should have waited. I'm sorry. There we go. Maybe I should have waited to submit or um, distribute those copies. But can you go to the next slide, please. Okay. So, actually, well, that's fine. This is a good. This is actually a good photo. So, again, um, one of the findings is that there's really no better way to develop the property get access to the property. Um, this is the location of the <clears throat> extension of 19th. Again, it's through that narrow parcel. In order to get to Cedar, they cross another parcel, and it's way at the south end. Uh, again, to develop this in any substantial way, they're going to have to have uh, two points of access to the property. So it makes it difficult if not too impossible to develop the property without uh, this right of way through here unless they had control of other property they're a private developer they don't have eminent domain power authority to to uh, acquire property other property uh, they just have to negotiate so there's really there's some basis for that for getting that variance or exception for the right of way width to make sure i remember now so with the 24 homes they just need one point of access and and if they expand that second plan B, they really need additional. Is that right? That is correct. Okay. Yeah, so uh, if, once they hit 30, 30 yes. dwellings. Oh, yes. I got it. Here's another way to look at this. If this was developed as apartments and that was a private drive, there you would even be considering that width as a private drive would fit in there just like the street does. Um, property zone for <coughs> what, what's being proposed is zone R2. Um, and that also allows duplexes. So this also shows the location of the barricade. So a little bit about the barricade. So again, when we were discussing this project, um, you looked at the traffic and with the addition of that extension to 19th Street, it takes that intersection and turns it into a five-way intersection, which is not a good situation, generally speaking. Um, one of the challenges here is that you, if you have two-way traffic on uh, on South Princeton providing access to those homes, so you have southbound traffic, if they want to turn on to the one-way couplet of Princeton, they have to do almost a 180-degree turn to get on there when it's designed. So it's already not a really good situation. It's just that this makes it just another traffic movement that makes that more complicated. So is there any other alternative to that that helps with the traffic flow. So I know that I know that uh, Director Tharp has has discussed uh, an alternative, and and one of those is to uh, reconfigure where it intersects here, and maybe he can explain that better. Uh, actually, um, it's okay. I would allow Mr. Harris to yeah. talk for just a minute. He has actually a diagram of, of what's been discussed. 
And I can discuss that too if you would like. And commissioners, what, what this diagram shows is um, what I refer to as an island. I refer to it kind of as a Y island. This is certainly not to scale, but what this does is helps what is never going to be a good situation, quite honestly. There's really, we're never going to create, you know, any kind of ideal situation here. But coming south on South Princeton, where you see the black dot between Main Street and Princeton, where these come together, would be an island that would force any traffic coming south to go at a right angle to what is labeled as South Main Street. It's, that's actually Princeton Street, too, but it's what's labeled as South Main Street. And so we gain some control of that intersection and the biggest thing that it creates and the movement that I've seen and would be most concerned about is somebody coming from that island where it sits and going west on 19th Street and taking the shortcut across there. It happens. We can't control everything. But with what we're talking about here with the island and with some signage. I believe what we're talking about here can make some sense. And you would have to, you could actually make that so it basically forces a person coming south to turn back. Exactly. Now we can't make, we can't force a person that decided they're going to make a wrong movement. Well, you know, if they come, if they come south and they get in that northbound lane and decide, well, I'm going to, we, we can't either. control everything. But this does can help control that intersection. And, yeah. and I like this idea better, Gary. I'm glad you drew this for us. And, and as the city manager mentioned, I had actually drew, drew more of a, a circle there instead of you know an outlet mm -hmm. to to let them get back to front yeah. shop. And there's a couple of things here, you know, to to you know actually create a barricade right there at 19th Street, so that controls some of the movements from 19th Street makes it a little more difficult. And this doesn't have as much of a tail on it going back to the north as I would expect that we would do. So it becomes more, more apparent what the movements need to be. And quite honestly, and from the developer standpoint, who has been very, very congenial in dealing with all of these, all of these issues, from a developer standpoint, this is likely much cheaper than somehow developing a turnaround that still does not eliminate all of the rear movements, the backing movements that would have to take place for delivery trucks, uh, whatever that is, garbage yeah. trucks, whatever that is yeah, that come clear out on that in stuff. there that it's jumping. Is there any concern about coming from, say, Walmart, you're heading north on Princeton? And you want to take the true Princeton, you got to slow down to make the negotiate that curve. I think it's 40 miles an hour in there. I'm just concerned with the range. It changes to 30 right there, but it is 40 and 30 right there. And commissioners, this is another one that I, that I hope everybody understands. We've had conversations. We will be pushing it forward with the police chief, but we really envision everything on Princeton Street from 17th Street to at least 23rd Street goes to 30 miles an hour. With the amount of traffic and the movements that we have in there at this point in time, it just makes sense. I would agree with that. I think even going to Price Chopper going south, people want to use the first exit into Price Chopper instead of using the acceleration lane. Yes. I don't know why they do that, but people do that and cars are coming 40 miles an hour. And that's yeah. down quickly. Exactly, down. exactly. And that's part of our reasoning for it. Yeah. Yeah. I do like that. I have a my son's 14 and I've been teaching him to drive and he questions me why when I'm there I look both ways uh when I'm turning on the one-way street and he's like mom there's so many cars coming from one way I'm like I've seen cars come down that road and go the opposite way to get into price shopper or something and um 
anyway, one of the questions I had, so on the drawing, um, so that extends 19th Street, so 19th Street comes up, what is at the end of 19th Street? So at the end of 19th Street, that stubs at that property, so when there's further development, that will be an extension of the street or private street or what have you. So, okay. So this is, we had them include all of the property in the plat. That way the preliminary plat will have notes. It did, they're on the now. Notes that that state what has to happen for future development. Of, sure. And, you know, they'll have to come back and do another preliminary plat. They will have to most likely do a traffic study. Um, so there wouldn't likely be uh, any traffic that would have to turn around at the end of that street. They would likely turn around before that, like they at, at the dead end. So, correct. They're not likely going to go down there because it's only it's less than 150 feet. Like just say yeah. a fire truck. Like if a fire truck went down there, uh, they they would likely be more over here or right here. So what, fire hydrants are all yeah. on the streets on the yeah. inside of those cul de sacs. Okay. Yeah. And so everything okay. that they do, everything that they would do, would pull hose from those access streets to the homes. And then they have, we've talked about the radius of the cul de sacs in there yeah. that meet what fire trucks need to turn around. The other yeah. would be just a dead end, just a dead end at this point in time. And the reason I handed that out was to just show you the detention basin because you can really see it on a plat. But I, but that's that's another <clears throat> that's another issue. So, so I guess the Harris is here. So when you are in your house and you go to Walmart, how to you put, how you get there? Anytime we go south, we do go to 17th Street just because of that intersection. Yeah, okay. But when we come from the south. I do it daily and depending upon exactly where I'm working in town, it's a lot of times it's multiple times a day. I come down that street from the south. Okay. Other questions, commissioners, or so we're kind of jumping from one thing to another. <laughs> So can we make, can we have a discussion, I guess, about one, um, yeah, I, I guess the, if we can have the discussion about the, uh, the right of way, you know, and kind of have, you know, our discussion, I guess, where we want, what, what we think, what we want to do with that. I know we're probably, I mean, if we make a decision, if we don't, um, and then we can kind of move on to what we think about this and then certain, please, yeah. yeah if I may, yeah. uh, Mike and I talked about this, we intend for this to be the first discussion. Okay. Good. We will have developers here uh, with to help answer any questions that you have next Monday. And then we would take this, if the commission so desires, to the regular meeting, which would be the first of February, be that Wednesday meeting. That's kind of our timeline at this point. Yeah, I think we we anticipate there might be questions that are technical in nature that we might not be able to answer. So if you have those types of questions, we could take those to the design team or to the engineer if necessary and answer those questions. So with the <clears throat> the typical width of 60 and only being 43 to 45, what's the negative impact that we could foresee? At this point in time, if I may, Mike, yeah. I, there is no negative impact. We have a lot of streets in town that are narrow like that. I'm not going to tell you that it's ideal. We shoot for 60. But where we have the easement, we're able to do the utilities outside. There's a sidewalk even on that north side, you know, that takes you across uh, 19th Street or, or Princeton. Uh, and we really didn't see any negative impact related to that. I think that I'll, I'll just add to that. So um, if anyone's affected by that, it would be the owners on the south and the north of that. Um, we had that early meeting, we attended both of those. Um, just because of the tightness of it, they have not expressed a concern about the width. That has not really been an issue. It wasn't, it wasn't something people objected to at the Planning Commission public hearing. Um, so, you know, the, the, the property on the south, he, want, he has a driveway access 
after their now, and he would like to to have that restored or retained. And there's a way to do that. Developers willing to do that. It can be incorporated into their street plans. Um, and so, no one has seen it as a negative impact. Really. So on that on that one drawing, I think this is it. There's private property to the north of the the road. Actual road. Mm -hmm. Correct. How many feet is that? Do you think we're going to get close to 60 feet by the time we add that in there? Uh, even though it's not, there's no measurements on here. That's it. That's so, a question. We can so there. Later. To answer your question, and I don't have a a great map in front of me to measure or anything, but there is there's a garage where you see that on this diagram here. Mm -hmm. There's a detached garage. This property owner apparently has an access easement through this parcel that they access that garage. So they're going to continue to do that. There's space between the garage and the edge of right of way. I don't know specifically what that space is. It should be the length of a car, which is 18 to 20 feet. And it certainly looks that way, but I, I you know, that's something I can, I can uh, get that detail. Commissioners, any other questions about this particular part of it? Do you think you just get it out? No, not the way it's currently designed. Kind of my case right now. They have a cold proper size for the back. It, is that the proper size? Because I didn't we talk about ideal size for you to turn around and what's not quite forty five? Or am I wrong? But the, these are actually bigger than. What is our standard? Um, we, myself, and the uh, commission came to an agreement on um, what size. And so I believe it's 80, 80 feet is what is in the in our standard. These are within. Oh, 60. It's 60. Return um, seats. Okay. I would say the developer has worked very hard to to meet, you know, what they have been asked to to create this subdivision. <laughs> You know, we've talked a lot about the need for housing, and I, from what I've talked to the residents, and I think we've talked to most of them at this point in time, I, nobody's against this subdivision that, that I've heard say so. I think everybody sees the need for housing. I think there were some concerns about understanding how they're doing it and some of those kinds of things. Uh, but uh, again, as Mike related, relayed, they've been doing this for a long time. So the belief is, is they. They have a handle on on uh, how they're uh, renting this house is basically kind of a rent to own concept that they're, that they're doing. Well, that's bare ground right now. So, and this particular subdivision could lead to a, a larger number of, of <clears throat> spaces. Commissioners, any other questions about the right of way? Do we have any other questions for Director Tharp or Director Hall on the um, possible blockade or suggestions um, like Mr. Harris's that he handed us about uh, adapting that uh, that street to make it work? Would that, would that all be done by the developer, all the cost for that, or would that be... The developer have already agreed to to uh, take the cost of, of doing some, some type of turnaround. And as I uh, related earlier, without actually doing an analysis of this particular idea, uh, my belief is it will be less expensive to the developer to do what we're talking about here than to figure out that turnaround. As most of you know, as you get to that turnaround, the grade in there gets pretty steep now, you know, so to do a turnaround, there's going to take more than just a, a, a place to turn around. It's going to take a retaining wall. It's going to take a number of things to make that work. 
you know, so what we're talking about here, and again, there is no perfect world, you know, can make a lot of sense in several directions. Any other questions on that? Director Hall, do you want to talk to us, talk to us about the handout that she gave us for the water recovery? Yeah, and I just wanted to address something very briefly because one of the concerns that, that the Harris's have is the stormwater from this. Um, so it is, we require a stormwater drainage study and it's been provided. It's under review. Uh, our consultant, our advisor on that, does not have any significant issues with it. It's required to not generate any additional runoff. Uh, and, and so it has to meet that standard. The stormwater drainage plan, that's not something you normally would even see. Uh, that would go to the Planning Commission and it's really beyond, it, it's such a technical matter. They just need to meet a, uh, you know, some certain standards for uh, design storms, uh, two year storm, 10 year storm and 100 year storm. And then again, sized so it doesn't generate, uh, there's no net increase in runoff. Um, what that, what's not obvious on this on the preliminary plat because the preliminary plat doesn't show the revised contour lines, but what that shows you at the tension basin, you can see the contour lines how they've been altered. That's about five feet deep at the tension pond. Now that fact in itself doesn't say, oh yeah, it meets the standards, but that just that's not obvious from the preliminary plat map. I, I think uh, I think. You know, I, I spoke with uh, Mr. Harris on the phone. I think he has legitimate concerns about it. There's a stormwater issue out there now. Um, and maybe that can be improved. I don't know. Commissioners, any questions for Director Hall on this item? So I guess, I mean, I, I guess it's a little, uh, hydrologist or what it would be that would make the final determination that this is a sufficient basin? So that stormwater plans uh, created by the, the developer's civil engineer okay. and then it's reviewed by, in this case, our city engineer, okay. someone that with the, the civil engineering background who knows about stormwater analysis. It's sort of technical and complicated. <laughs> But it's minimally sufficient. Mm -hmm. That's our, that's where we're at Some today. That's what I've been told. There aren't any significant issues. That has to be concluded with all, <clears throat> all reasonable accuracy that, that it meets that requirement. Any other questions for Director Hall? Thank you. Thank you. I know we had two public comments. Who's our first? Jerry Harris. Jerry, come on up, please. Please state your name for everybody. Gary Harris. I live at 1801 South Princeton Street. Thank you. Um, first off, I'll be right up front, and if any of you paid any attention to the uh, Planning Commission meeting on the January 11th meeting, it's pretty obvious I got to be in a burn under my saddle over this. And to start off with, they said they contacted everybody that was going to be affected. I never received any notifications this was going to happen. I found out about this on January 9th, two days prior to the meeting. Um, that being said, I'll, I'll, well, since you guys have already got the picture that I drew on the uh, closing off Princeton Street. Now, I'll, I'll stress this by saying I don't believe this was the intent, but this is how it was received. There was a, a concern about the diameter of the cul-de-sacs going into the new subdivision and being able to turn fire trucks around. I get it. Very accurate. Very needed concern. However, we're jumping over here 200 feet to the west and we're looking at making a dead end street that's only 18 feet, six inches wide. 
why is it a concern over here in the new subdivision, but not a concern for these other seven houses or so that's going to be affected by it? Those other houses are just as important as the ones in the new subdivision. Um, by putting that up there, they talked about having a turnaround. Um, I visited the fire chief a little bit about it. He said it meets what would be required by code. Um, I measured it. I come up with they would be backing 342 feet. Our chief said 350 feet, potato, potato, whatever. Of all truck accidents, 30% constitute are made of backing accidents. And when you get into the solid waste industry, it's 80% the accidents are backing accidents so we're we're running these trash trucks up and i know two of the three trash services in town service that so we're running those up there we're running the fedex trucks the amazon the ups the mail carrier the city's own snow removal trucks are going to be running up there and backing 350-ish feet to turn around that is not a a good scenario it, it, it's just not um, right now the trash trucks and Amazon and whoever if they especially if they know the area they're able to enter from the south exit to the north I live down there and I very seldom ever exit to the south but I come in from the south daily sometimes multiple times a day it will affect me um, A little concerned at the meeting on January 11th at the 12 and a half minute mark it said the recommendation was to approve the preliminary plat referencing the substandard right-of-way width period at that point it said nothing about closing off Princeton Street but yet in your staff memorandum that you received for today's meeting on page 4 the last line of the first paragraph specifically is asking for the closure of Princeton Street. And I'm kind of looking over my shoulder like, what are, what are we trying to do here? Now, I don't know at what point in time this gets stamped final and that said this is the way it is and this is the way we're moving forward. But I'd like to get ahead of the game is the reason I'm here, reiterating a lot of what I said at the January 11th meeting. Um, <clears throat> I discussed percentage of backing accidents. At the one hour mark, Mr. Hall stated that the traffic study did not address the closing of Princeton Street. It was just recommended by the city. Um, at the hour and four minute mark of the meeting, the chairperson was adamant that Princeton Street be closed to help with the wrong way traffic. The bulk of that wrong way traffic comes out of Price Chopper, turning south and comes out of Orsland turning south. Not 100% of it, but the bulk of it does. Closing Princeton Street ain't going to affect that one way or another. And you know, he, he stated that, well, I had a business down there and I seen it. His business that he had was clear down in front of uh, Walmart next door to Freddy's. So what his business had to do with the closing of Princeton Street up there at 19th, it's irrelevant. Uh, <clears throat> it was mentioned numerous times that when they were referring to the traffic study and the stormwater issue, and I'll get to that in a minute, but it was, it was stated that, well, this was done by engineers, licensed people, they know what they're doing. And the inference that I got from it was, these people are smart, they're educated, they know what we're doing, and we don't have any right to question them. That's wrong. Anybody that has worked in the construction industry for any length of time has looked at a set of blueprints that was drawn by a licensed engineer and looked at them and said, hmm, that's not going to work. They make mistakes. That's what your planning commission 
is for is to hopefully catch these mistakes. And yet my Paul's department and Mr. Elmer's department to oversee that also. I don't care how educated or smart they are. They're going to make mistakes. It happens. And just because it works on paper doesn't mean it's going to work in the real world. At least four of the planning commission members requested more information on the traffic study and how it was conducted. They never got it. And they, they were told more than once, that's above our pay grade. Pay grade, no pay grade, education or no education. The people on that commission had questions that should have been answered. If they're not gonna answer the questions, what's the purpose of the commission? As far as the stormwater is concerned, they're dumping every gallon of their stormwater off in my backyard. I already got water issues. I don't need no more. Now, what they, can I get you to put that slide back up that was up there when I got up? This is my property right here. The stormwater, for the most part, already runs right down through here. But right here, it enters a four foot diameter pipe. It goes across to Mr. Fogel. Now, something that I stated incorrectly to um, Micah Sauter uh, was that all of this stormwater comes down and ties into the same pipe. It does not. They're, there's another pipe there that joint, they run side by side and they literally dump off in the corner of the quarry over here. But Mr. Souter stated in a phone, via phone conversation with him that the pipe size on his outlet structure was two 30 inch pipes. Okay, I did the math. Two 30 inch pipes make up just over two thirds of the volume that a 48 inch will carry. And what but what they didn't take into consideration was all of this water out of these front yards comes down, runs across my front yard, and there's a swale that runs between Mr. Fogel and myself. It comes down here, and it enters that 48-inch pipe, too. Now, I, I can do a lot of calculations. I'm pretty sharp on my math, but I don't know how to calculate that water watching it run down a ditch other than I know it gets deep. So our, that pipe is maxed out going across there. Um, I visited with the lady that owns the nursery over here just today. She said, I would love to have that water. She said, I'm concerned on how you're going to get it here. She said, but I would love to have that water. And it wouldn't be difficult to direct it right out of their retention pond, right down the property line, and kick it off into that quarry. And this aerial doesn't show enough of it, but her and I looked at her aerial picture that she had. It's not going to be hard to get it to where she wants it. But that's going to alleviate, it's going to eliminate any more water coming off on me. And it's actually going to help me with the water I got. That, that's not going to assist with this. But bottom line, that was there when I moved in. I knew it. I got nothing to complain about here about it. That one's on me. Um, at the after the planning commission meeting on uh, the 11th, I spoke with the developer and Mr. Souter. They assured me that they would work with me to try to alleviate my concerns on the stormwater. However, there's nothing in writing. I, I don't know at what point in time I lose all leverage to try to get these problems alleviated. Because at some point in time, it's going to reach that point that, um, sorry, Gary, it's already done, too bad. I don't know what that point is. I don't know if that's today's meeting or when it is. Um, if you got any questions, I'll try to answer them. Um, 
whether it be the stormwater or the uh, picture I drew on the Princeton Street. Well, Mr. Harris, I will tell you that I appreciate your comments, and I will tell you, as, as we mentioned earlier, that no, no decisions were going to be made on anything. Um, at this point, it's just preliminary. Um, we are getting some of the information. I know the planning commission needed an answer from us, which once again, they're not getting today on how they might move forward, you know, if there's a blockade or not a blockade or whatever else. So at this point, it's all preliminary. This is great information that you brought to us, and I appreciate your concerns absolutely. I'm certainly going to take them into, into account, and uh, I've been taking some notes too, so I'll reach out and ask questions also. So, and, and if anybody wants to come down to my backyard and look at what I'm talking about, because it's a lot easier to lay an eyeball on it, at least it is for me. And there's the little pictures. So, thank you. Thank you. Was there a. Do you get Karen Harris? Karen, come on. Please state your name, please. Karen Harris, HM on South Princeton. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I have a lot to say in a short amount of time. I'm not a speaker, so I'm going to jump around a lot uh, on several concerning issues. So, I. Uh, at the December Planning Commission meeting, they told the commissioners that they had reached out to all the homeowners. But then they said that three had attended, and then the next sentence they said none of them had attended. So I was very confused. But what I did know was the first uh, was most of the homeowners were first hearing about this at that notification for the Planning Commission. So we knew nothing about it. You saw where we lived, lots of runoff. Uh, after some dancing around, we asked them how did they reach out to us? And after dancing around on answers, they said, uh, well, we reached out to the title companies and that's probably where we got your, the information. And we're like, we've lived here for 20 years. The, both the title companies know who we are, how to get a hold of us. Uh, so we just, we were a little concerned when they weren't concerned that all the water coming on that person wouldn't be interested in there. So we're, I thought, cause for question there for me. Um, and right out of the gate, I'm already questioning what they're up to. Uh, also, this is prevent, presented as rent to own houses. And so I asked for more information and it's actually not. It's section 42 rentals, which are tax credits. Section 42 is low income housing program. To live there, you won't be able to make over a certain income. And it's usually around 60% of the area median income. But the rent isn't cheap. So why do you keep referring to it as affordable housing? I don't know. They have to be 15 or rentals for 15 years and then the plan was to sell them in 15 years and to turn it into an HOA to maintain the public areas of the retention pond and the play area. Uh, so all of a sudden we're going to be blessed with another housing issue again in 15 years. Does so me why again we did that? So the chair of the planning commission didn't want to discuss the fair housing issues, so we never got answers to that, but again they're misrepresenting what this is. So the vice chair uh, asked a, about the HOA. He said, would they be rentals for 15 years and then the house is to be sold and renters or anyone else would want to live there and the HOA, HOA would be formed. The HOA would take care of the public spaces. I asked about their conversion to home ownership because the program's website says that the conversion must be optional to the tenant household and refusal or inability inability to purchase a unit cannot be grounds for termination or non-renewal of a lease. So in 15 years, they're no longer renting, but they cannot make them move. It still becomes a rent, it still maintains a rental. So if 15% of those people choose to buy and 50% choose not to buy, what happens with the HOA idea? Are the dues of 12 houses gonna be able to pay for the cost of maintaining the public areas? Um, so there's some questions on that that never got addressed, um, and I really was concerned on what they were answering. Uh, next concern was our street's very narrow. It's 18 feet, six inches wide. To compare with the new street of 45 feet, so ours is about 45, 43% of what the new street will be, just to give you a, a gauge, less than half of their new street. So we have no sidewalks, and when it rains, it floods the street down to one lane with no outlet. So I'm going to be meeting delivery trucks, backing down, avoiding the poor person that's walking on the street because there's no sidewalks. And the other day, just the other day, we had rain. I'm driving down the street. I'm meeting a car. 
there's a guy walking, he's walking on the street because there's no sidewalk. He, he realizes that there's two cars coming, steps off on the grass and I'm partially on the grass, partially on the street and going super slow so not to spray water on him, which happens a lot. Um, so after, and if you watch the planning commission meeting on January 11th, there were four commissioners that repeatedly asked to get more information on the traffic study. And the staff who was really pushing to get the, uh, go ahead and approve it saying that the folks that did the traffic study were highly qualified. I believe the old saying is trust, but verify. If you have four out of five people asking for more information and time, then you shouldn't just push it through. And the way the agenda read, it was for the plot and the street variance, and the staff kept referring to it's only for the street variance. And staff member in for today's meeting on page four, paragraph one, it states, commission is also being asked to consider in addition to the barricade, uh, addition of a barricade at South Princeton North uh, of East 19th in the conditions preliminary plot. And lastly, I would like for them to build a privacy fence for all the trash for the construction. We get it from Walmart, we get it from Freddy's, and the construction is going to make it worse. So I really feel like this was being pushed through with the planning commission wasn't comfortable. So I would ask that you guys think it, look at things because it was pushed before and uh, very concerning to uh, several of the neighbors. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioners, as always with every item, if you have any questions or, or concerns, certainly reach out to <coughs> Director Hall, and I'm sure we know most of the planning commissioners, so if you reach out to them and, and uh, ask them their, their opinions, we can certainly get those. Um, I do appreciate, Mr. and Mrs. Harris, your, your opinions and I hear your comments, um, and certainly have made some notes, and I will be reaching out to them, so thank you. If you got more questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Will do. Thank you. All right, that'll move us on to item three, which is our fire department comprehensive study. Chief Mathias, good evening. Good evening. So on the back of your packet, I believe, or in your iPad, the last page, contains a memo that we sent for, for your package. And, and it uh, talks about our comprehensive study. This study had been looked at, uh, talked about, discussed. I think we're going on about two and a half, three years on trying to get this thing up. And it, it's more of a station location study than, than anything. I think I know where a station, our next station should go, but uh, I don't want that on my shoulders when it's in the wrong spot. And so there are trained people out there that know what they're doing. Um, and with this comprehensive study, they look at a lot of things. Our, our, our routes we take, the time of day, the number of calls, projected growth, um, age of the city population. They take in a lot of data to make their recommendations on not just where a station should be, the next station should be located, but on how we move forward as a fire department in our response, um, possible staffing, all that. Um, so we sent out an RFP and I meant to look it up, but uh, we sent it out and we had two uh, proposals come back. And uh, the first one was the Center for Public Safety Management, uh, CPSM. Um, and the second was the Center of Public Management International, uh, excuse me, Center of Public Management and Emergency Service Consulting International, ESCI. And on the bottom of your last page, you can see the, the note or the, the proposals come in at the, uh, what they came in as. Uh, ESCI, I did not fulfill their uh, the RFP's recommendations. Um, they did not submit any references, did not submit a completed fire station study, uh, requested copies of, of other, other uh, proposals they have done, and they would not give them to us. And uh, and also they did not exceed or they did not submit a, a do not exceed cost um cpsm did 
to include everything that was asked for on the RFP. Uh, unfortunately, it's a, a much higher higher dollar amount, but I think with what the references they gave us and they gave us a uh, a uh, proposal out of Roswell, Georgia, uh, that is a, over a hundred pages long uh, of their of their uh, proposal, their study of Roswell, exact same thing they're going to do for us, uh, and very detailed, very um, immensely detailed. Uh, so our recommendation is to move forward with uh, CPSM at a no uh, no more not to exceed seventy six thousand five hundred dollars. So this is one hundred percent coming from ARPA funds. Yes, this yes. this does <clears throat> come from ARPA funds. That's, yes, if I might, I concur with the chief and Melanie's recommendation because what I know after forty three years is it isn't always about the low proposal submitted. And I agree with the chief's analysis on this because I saw both proposals and it didn't take me very long to get to the point where I felt that um, CPSM made the better proposal and would give us better information so that you and future commissions could could make a decision about where that second station ought to go. And so <clears throat> this is a process. So it's about a six month process from start to finish. And I'll just go through some of, of what uh, the, the process is. we will start off with a kickoff meeting and that is with um, the city's project team. That will be with fire personnel, with finance personnel and a few other department employees outside of the fire department. Um, First thing I'll do is collect all of our data. They they have a whole list. It'll take us probably two months to get them all the data they need. Uh, next, they move on to identifying our strengths and weaknesses uh, as a fire department through our response model, finances, staffing. They they hit it all. Then they uh, go talk to the finance folks and get a budget budgetary analysis on how the how the fire department fits in the city, what percentage is a, you know, a general fund. And then, uh, then they, they compare us to like cities around the region and across the nation. Uh, this company has done uh, studies for cities that were 8,000 all the way up to 80, 800,000. So they're very, very well versed in, in what they're doing. What I like about number step five is stakeholders meeting. They will meet with you, uh, elected officials, appointed officials, uh, command staff for the fire department, our friends and neighbors, the EMS folks, and local law enforcement, just to have to get their idea, opinions on on uh, this study. Recommendations will be sent out in a draft. Uh, product we will look at it make any adjustments and then the final will come out in an executive summary uh, they will do that on site uh, it will fly here and, and present it to the commission and any other stakeholders that want to be in the room so give or take six month process we'll update you as we walk through the process with them uh, some of you will be in the process if not all of you at some point in time. So um, that's where we're at. Will this help our CSO rating or at least keep it? Uh, so yes, yeah. so part of the, the uh, study is to give us, uh, give us ideas on how to increase that ISO. ISO okay. Yeah, so, and we're really close. We're really close to getting a, to moving up uh, we're currently a three and we're very close to a two and we're looking at possibly looking at the, going for another application this year. So that's quite extensive too. Chief Matthias, did you reach out to the rep, anybody on the reference list and were any of those local? 
uh, as in regionally local? Yeah, Topeka had used uh, CPSM, and I believe that was the, the, the closest. Um, there were some in Missouri and Iowa, um, but the, from the ones we talked to, and of course they're looking at your website and all the all the uh, feedback, they pick and choose the feedback. Sure. Uh, we are very, very satisfied with, and we've met them, and we've had a couple meetings uh, via Zoom with these folks and interviewed them, and so we feel very, very comfortable moving forward. Do you happen to recall what the what the estimated budget amount was for the study? It was fifty five thousand when we started first look at this, which is what we um, it was either fifty or fifty five, but that was a budget amount we used in the general fund if we were going to do this, and we actually put proposals out once. Yeah. And it came back and was considerably over that. And then we went back and then ARPA appeared. Does that answer your question? Yes, yeah, it does. Commissioners, any other questions for Chief Matthias? And I don't, I don't, I think these were the same two proposals. We, we actually had three the first, the first time. time. Right, three. Yeah, three the first time. Yeah. Two this time. The one that, uh, the other one that came, uh, gave us proposal the first time were full. They could, it was a year, year and a half out before they could even look, look at us. Chief, you may have already addressed this, but, and I, and I missed it. Um, did you talk about a timeline that they thought that would have, they could complete this task? If we get on it, it will be more roughly six months, but we'll have okay. that kickoff meeting will give us uh, a, a better look at overall time frame. but the six months is a pretty good, pretty good uh, swipe. How soon do you need an answer then? Today would be yesterday. Great, so, What's it yesterday? Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, that's so that's kind of the question I was going to ask the commission. Do you need to see this again? If you if you don't feel like you need to see it again, just I mean, we uh, and it, a meeting and honestly, to meeting, to meeting so. it doesn't. If you want to, that's fine. It doesn't have. We can re revisit it again. It doesn't. Commissioner, how do you feel? I don't think I need to see it again. I think I think so. Does anybody want to make a motion? Please. Yes. Hold on, please. I was, I was Hold on, please. I was going to say you moved to your first meeting in February. Whatever. $20,000 more than we had estimated, so something to shake a stick at. Whether it's ARPA funds or not, it's still funds that are being utilized. Well, here's the reason I make that suggestion. I get nervous when you make when you make motions here, and I realize there are times when there's an emergency situation. This is not an emergency situation. And the greatest transparency you can get is having this at a city commission meeting where we probably have our greater viewership about what's going on. But it's your call. I would say wait till the February meeting. If you're okay with that. Absolutely. It's yeah. not gonna make any yeah. difference. No one way or another one. No. Do you, and commissioners, did you, do you wanna just move this on to our February 1st agenda? Yes. Okay, that's what we'll do. Real quick, yes. uh, conradfire.com. If you want to go look at our new truck being built, uh, they have progress uh, pictures. I believe they put them in every week. So it gives you a good idea of where, where we're at. Um, kind of unique. Maybe you can put a picture in your next month or your it's and, But you ought to go, you ought to go look because it's really kind of neat. Thing. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure it's good. Yeah, it's it's interesting to see how they're built and everything that goes into it. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that'll move us on to comments by our city manager. So the only reason this is here, Commissioner, just to give you a heads up so you can discuss it next week, unless you want to discuss it now. What? Are we talking? You mean board assignments? Board assignments. Board assignments. Pardon me? You mean board assignments? Yes. Oh, okay. Sorry. So. I, I, I mean, I know uh, Gore sent out an email the other day about if anybody wanted to keep a board assignment. I never saw any response to it, so I don't know if anybody wants to keep their board assignment. Um, you're not supposed to see responses. Okay. I, That's I, probably why I didn't see it. That's why. I will only say, um, I, yeah, I would like to stay on uh, auto municipal, auto 
auditorium, if that's fine. And I did have um, a thought. I know uh, Commissioner Clayton does not have a board, I believe. Just pray boss. Oh, pray boss. Okay, okay. okay. Mm -hmm. um, if it was it was incorrect on there. That's what I was thinking. Mike, you're on three. I was gonna and say four. I saw your name you're on, on there, four. but well, play task force. Airport, there. chamber of commerce, and the airport. Prairie Falls and play task force. And Zach has prairie, prairie Falls now. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah, and I was gonna say so you had expressed an interest in Main Street before. Um, and I think the only benefit to that would be well, not the only benefit, he has some really good ideas, but um, with me having helped um, this far, I also don't want it to be where I'm directing, you know, that how they how they function from now on. So I almost wonder if it would be better if I step off and let him. Commissioner that. Clayton, would you be okay with stepping in for Commissioner Graves for Definitely. Main Street? Yep. Okay. I'm assuming everything else. you on. You said you're on Prairie Falls also. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it should still more on there. Okay. Commissioners, are we okay with maintaining the boards that we're on then? Otherwise, okay, that answers that. Thank, Thank you, you for not putting me on any that are 7 30 in the morning. <laughs> I, I saw like those, those, I was like, Who wants those? <laughs> I like 5 p.m. I like morning ones, yeah. get them done. <laughs> it's eight o'clock now, oh, so okay. I mean, you okay. slept in. Okay, uh, do you have any other comments? Okay, uh, comments by our city commissioners, Commissioner Graves. I have no comments. Commissioner Kaylee. None at this time. Commissioner Clayton. None at this time. Mayor Pro Tem Skidmore. Kansas State's ranked fifth in the nation, eight piece. <laughs> Can you please put your phone that's, down? Yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> any other comments? Uh, I have no comments. We will move into a, an executive session. Um, Mr. Finch, could you uh, give us that state uh, mortgage, please? Um, commissioners, I don't know if you want to stretch your legs and take a yes, five yes. minute bathroom break, yeah, but you. when we come back, I can give you a motion and we can get started. Yeah, let's do that. Let's, thank you. I was going to ask for it. Yeah, perfect.